Hello everyone and welcome to this special APNA webinar, a practical update on MBS Billings in nurse clinics. To begin, I would like to firstly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. My name is Linda Govan and I'm a project manager at APNA and for the last four years I've been working on a number of nurse clinic projects. So I know how challenging the topic of funding can be for nurse clinics. One of our key learnings is that their success depends on a number of factors, but perhaps the two most critical factors are around funding and financial viability. But we also know that nurses that have a good understanding of the concepts of, um, sorry, good understanding of the concepts of financial concepts, sorry, and um, MBS have a confidence in the application of MBS billings that they're better able to advocate within their own organisations when they're thinking about setting up new service models for patients. So that's what brings us here today. So the aim of this webinar is to enable you to increase your knowledge and confidence in understanding what MBS items can be claimed in nurse clinic models and to also support your understanding in how to put a budget together. So we'll be covering those. Um, two key areas today. So firstly, to help us understand who's in the audience, and we know there's a lot of people that have logged on today, so that's pretty exciting for us. We'll start with two quick polling questions. So the first question is, what is your professional role? Are you a nurse, a practice manager, a GP, PHN staff or other? And we'll just um, watch, watch what the poll says and get a feel for who's in the audience. And we'd also really be keen for you throughout this webinar to ask your questions. So there's a message box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen um, and we should have time during the webinar to uh, cover your questions as we go and let's just have a look at who's, who's joining us. So we've got nearly 60% of the, the audience's nurses so that's fantastic. We've got about 20% of practice managers. We've got a couple of GPs, that's fantastic. PHN staff and a, a, a grouping of others. So that's good, so we've got a nice a nice audience um, mix there. Our second poll question is, are you currently running nurse clinics at your practice? The answers being yes, no, or not, 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 not able, not available. We'll just move down to that one. And I guess from my experience in, in the project, projects that we've been doing is that nurses who might consider that it's not actually a nurse clinic, but they're doing a chronic disease management session one afternoon a week, we would suggest to you that that is a type of a nurse clinic. And I think uh, Rivka will be talking about that today as we, we, as we move through the presentation. So let's just have a look at how many people are running nurse clinics. Yep, great. Okay, so we've got about 40% of people at the moment in the audience who say yes, they are. 46% no, and about 15% are saying that it's not, not applicable. So again, ask your questions through the session. Um, we'll definitely try and get to your questions as we go through. If you have any technical issues, please feel free to call Redback Technical Support on 1800 733 416. Right. And just as a reminder, this session is being recorded and you will receive a link to the, to the recording at the end of the webinar. So that will come directly to you via email. And if you could also stay online at the end of the webinar just to complete the evaluation survey, it's really important that we get your feedback um, so that we can keep improving the, this type of presentation. So now let's get started with the actual webinar. I'm pleased to introduce Rivka Hagen, who has many years experience, both as a practice manager and a business consultant for general practice. Rivka is the owner and principal consultant of Medical Business Services and he's also an accreditation surveyor as well as a director with Rural Workforce Agency Victoria and chair of the COBOL Community Health. We are very fortunate to have Rivka here today to share her experience. So welcome Rivka. Thank you so much for inviting me along today to have a talk about uh, MBS Billings in nurse clinics and um, I'm pleased to let you know that I was uh, highly involved in the development of the tool that we are going to be discussing very shortly. So I, before we get started too, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging also.
So a quick agenda for you of what we're going to be covering in this particular session. So we will shortly flip across to the nurse clinic budget tool and just a reminder we will show you a link to where you can find this. This is a free tool that's available for you um, and this is being, uh, being provided through APNA. And uh, what we're going to do is, is actually work through that budgeting tool, working through those MBS items and how you can manipulate that budgeting tool to model and reflect what your nurse clinic uh, might actually look like. We're going to have a close look too at um, how we can incorporate some other sources of funding to help you with that budgeting. So we're going to talk about the Practice Nurse Incentive Program, which is shortly changing to the Workforce Incentive Program. We'll also have a talk about the QI PIP, which is the Quality Improvement Practice Incentive Payment, um, and some other sources of funding. We will then have a, a very quick look at some other income that you might want to uh, to budget for as well. And then we'll have a look at the flip side, which is about estimating the expenses to do with your your uh, with your clinic. So the, the biggest one of that, of course, is going to be the, uh, the fees that are payable to your GPs. We're going to look at your staffing costs and some, um, some other issues as well. And that's going to then give us the answer of whether your clinic is viable, whether this is something that you're going to be be able to run with on an ongoing basis. What I would say at the outset too is that this budgeting tool can be used not just for planning the, uh, the, the nurse uh, services that you might want to run in future, but you can actually use it to model the current activities that you are already undertaking. For a lot of practices, it can be actually quite difficult to put your finger on the pulse of how those clinics are performing in isolation because the finances kind of get muddled up with the, the rest of uh, practice income and expenses as well. So if you are already running your nurse clinics, you can plug in the figures of what you're actually doing at the moment and that's going to give you a really good sense of financially how your, um, how your clinics are tracking as well. Then we're going to have a look at uh, a bit of mind mapping and we're going to just look at some workflows for a diabetes uh, clinic and the sorts of activities that you might want to contemplate um, for that. So before we kick off, I would like to ask uh, another poll question for you. And that is, how confident are you currently in planning your nurse clinics? So feel free to participate in this poll. We're really keen to see whether you feel pretty confident, very confident, uh, perhaps somewhat confident, or you are really lacking in the confidence. And what we're aiming for is that when uh, the session is done today, your confidence will be, um, will be improved. So that's what we're, we're looking at. And right. Linda, how are the results well, looking? I can tell you, Rivka, that um, the audience is not feeling very confident today. It's about nearly 50% of people who are watching today are not feeling at all confident about setting up their clinic. And 2% are very confident. 16 17% confident and somewhat. So, yeah, somewhat 42% not confident. So I would say that there's a majority All right, of so we're going to, we're to, going right to be doing some <laughs> confidence building in this and yeah. um, I'm sure that you'll find that the budgeting tool is going to make it a whole lot easier for you to start planning your services and then run with it. So um, I, enjoy. Yes. Um, Rivka, there's one really probably just to get the ball rolling with the questions, but um, Sarah's asking how we can assist um, in how everyone builds nursing efforts with patients as a collaborative partnership with a GP. So I guess, I mean, you're going to be talking about that today. Yeah, that's, that so. will certainly be covered yeah. off in the budgeting tools. So stick around and uh, we'll cover all of that off. Yeah. So on the slide that you will see at the moment, uh, there's a big fat green arrow pointing at the APNA website and the URL is, uh, is, is in orange above. It, it shows you where you can actually download the tool that we're going to be talking about. It is completely updated um, and current in terms of the Medicare benefit schedule items and the associated fees. So um, after today's session, feel free to download this. Have a really good play around with it. There are some other modules available um, on the APNA website that will help you with getting started and modelling your clinic as well. So this is an adjunct uh, to that. 
so we'll flip across to the uh, the budgeting spreadsheet and uh, we are now going to um, model what this might look like. So um, you'll see this is called the Nurse Clinic Budgeting Tool and uh, what you will see is um, the, the, the spreadsheet is laid out with the income um, area on the left hand side in blue and then over on the right hand side the expenses uh, associated with your clinic on the right. Now what I want to um, highlight as well is that you know what do you call a clinic? How do you estimate what a clinic will be? And I'm really happy to tell you that a clinic can be whatever you determine that to be. So a clinic could be a session whether it is you know three or four hours a morning or an afternoon that might constitute one clinic for you or it could be an entire day. So the time frame is entirely flexible in terms of of what's most meaningful to you. So let's have a look at the, um, the income calculator to start off with. What you'll see here down the left hand column are all of the MBS item numbers that are most commonly um, associated with nurse clinics and services uh, to do with health assessments and GP management plans and chronic disease services that are frequently used um, in association with nurse clinics. All of the blue shaded areas or the light blue shaded areas are the input areas. So everything that's white you can't touch and that will help to ensure that the, uh, the spreadsheet remains, um, r remains stable and, um, and usable. You'll see the Medicare rebates are effective from the 1st of November 2019. So all of these amounts listed here are correct uh, for, for the time being. And certainly as Medicare introduces changes to the MBS figures, these amounts will be updated and be available through the APNA website um, as time goes on. So how do you go about using this? Well, um, what you will want to do is think about what your, your, your activities might look like within a session of your nurse clinic. So um, you, what you want to to indicate here in this column E is the number of patients per session for whom you're going to be completing, for example, a GP management plan, for example, a team care arrangement, a GP management plan review, etc. So think about how many services you're going to fill in whatever you've called a, um, a session to be. We then have given you in the column to the right the um, suggested time that you might want to take as a nurse in completing these items. So you'll see here the suggested time for a GP management plan is 45 minutes. If we are running one GP management plan in our service, we are then indicating that uh, the time per clinic for GP management plans is 45 minutes. In the next example down, you might say that uh, you're doing two team care arrangements in association with, um, with your clinic. So if we're doing two and we nominally, we nominally recommend that that might be 15 minutes because it's usually an adjunct to the GP management plan, that would then end up as a 30 minute activity and I'll show you in a moment why these numbers are really important in helping you to estimate your other costs as well. Now you're able to override the suggested nursing times in column F through your own, uh, your own determination. So in the example here, we said we recommend 45 minutes for a GP management plan, but we've overridden that and said, no, our nurses will get 60 minutes, a full hour to do, to do a GP management plan. But on the flip side, we've said we are not allocating any additional time for uh, team care arrangements in that. So 60 minutes is the completion of, um, all, of all of those activities. What you'll see then is that you get uh, an allocation of your own time allocation throughout the clinic. So there are recommendations and then you can make that what you want it to look like. What you'll see then in the Medicare rebate column and then the totals is it will multiply the number of services that you're going to deliver 
by the Medicare rebate to tell you what the total income generation is going to be for your clinic. So you'll see with the GP management plan, if we're only doing one of those, the um, income derived from that activity, be, activity will be $146.55. If we update that to, say, two services you'll see that that's updated the total in the um, in the last column there to 293, reflecting that you're doing two items of $146 and so on. So this listing along here will give you re some really good prompters as to the types of activities that you can complete um, as part of your nursing service. We'll just quickly run through them. We've got um, GP management plans and team care arrangements, the reviews associated with those. Uh, the 10997, which are the nurse services, and uh, don't forget those. You might include those as part of a planned clinic, or you might say, as per this example, we're not including them in the actual clinic work because perhaps a clinic decides to deliver those services at a later date. It's not actually part of the clinic service. But if it is for you, feel free to put the numbers in there and so on. Um, so we also have listed all of the um, health assessment item numbers, the 701s to the 707s, as well as the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Health Check 715. The new heart health check is in the spreadsheet as well, and we've nominally included two items of a heart health check. We've given the nurse 15 minutes to complete that, giving a total of 30 minutes there. Now, what you'll see is uh, the rest of the item numbers there, and you can work through those at your own pace when you have a play with, uh, with this spreadsheet yourself. Further down, you'll see that there is uh, some real flexibility in this tool whereby you can add your own practice item numbers. So we will um, nominally put in a, a test item here, and uh, we can uh, fill in those blue boxes and say we are going to give that 30 minutes each and uh, we will give, no, 30 services is perhaps a little bit much. Let's make it three and we're, uh, we're going to put 30 minutes on that. And the dollar amount you'll need to specify if the activity that you're going to undertake does have a dollar value associated with it as well. So I'll nominally put in $10 here so you'll see how you can easily add in your own items in the way that is meaningful for your practice. For now, I'll um, take this away just so that that's um, updated there. And what you can see down the bottom, um, and I won't run through the, the patient gap fee, but you can include that also if that's relevant to your, your clinic. We can see here that the total attendance item um, income comes to $1,106.20 for our, uh, our dummy clinic in terms of the way that we want to model this. So that's good. This is the figure that is used to determine some uh, key expenditure items too. So this amount is important that, um, that you, you get that right. In terms of your clinic, you may also be running some services that are nurse-only income items, and you'll see here that they are excluded from the GP cost calculation. Some examples given here are for a wound clinic um, and perhaps a cervical screening clinic. So again, if you want to include that, but your GPs don't derive any income out of that themselves, you can model that in, um, in this box here, and it will certainly filter it into your modelling, but exclude it from um, the calculation for working out how much your GPs will get paid. Let's now flip across to a new section in this worksheet, which is regarding the, the QI PIPs. So this is the Quality Improvement Practice Incentives Program, and this is a, a, a newer fee structure that uh, came into effect late last year. So let's go across, because there's a little bit of calculation um, included in that. And just give me one moment. Here we go. 
So there is a, a little bit of a blurb around how you can best use this and for the nurses out there, if you want to use this, uh, this budgeting tool, I would suggest that you have a talk to your practice manager about obtaining your last uh, uh, practice incentive statement because from that you're going to be looking at some data that will help you uh, to, to estimate some income from there. So you'll be looking for some information to do with your SWIPIS, which is the standardised whole patient equivalent, and you will derive that directly from your last PIP statement. So that's very difficult for me to predict here. I've nominally given this an amount of 3100 which means that we're talking about a, um, a practice that might look something like three or thereabouts full-time equivalent uh, GPs. If that's the case, then the estimated annual income for the QI PIP is fifteen thousand and five hundred dollars, and that's the uh, that's the, the maximum that can be gained there. From your statement two, in this blue box here for the percentage of rural loading, you would put in the figure that is applicable for your practice. It may be zero percent, it may be twenty, it may be um, up to forty percent. It's uh, entirely dependent on your location, and it will calculate what your loading um, amount will be. So that's an automatic calculation. You don't need to do anything about that. So we've left this at zero percent for a more metropolitan practice, which would then be just a total income of fifteen thousand five hundred. Now the spreadsheet then uh, divides that out by 52 to give you a nominal amount of income to the practice per week on account of this program. And then from there that weekly allocation will give you an idea of how much of that weekly allocation you might want to um, allocate to your, uh, your, your nurse clinic budgeting. So in this example, I've given $65 out of that total of 298 to say we would nominally want to include that as part of the, uh, the budgeting for this. But you can change that to whatever you want it to be. You could change that to, um, to $100 if that's what you wanted to do. And you will see whatever you call it here, that amount is going to be reflected back into the spreadsheet where it forms part of the overall calculation. So I'm just going to bring that back to 65 again um, of where it previously was. What you'll see now is that we now have a total recurring income per session of $1,171 and, and thereabouts. And that's good because that gives you an immediate feedback of what a session is worth in terms of practice income. Furthermore, you can add um, any one-off income that you may be able to get your hands on. So, for example, some grant funding or any other source of income that you also want to include as part of, um, it, as part of this, um, this calculation. So that then is the end, of, um, the end of the income estimation. We're now going to flip back up to the green side and have a look at the expenses. So now that we know how much the clinic is going to generate in terms of revenue, we are now going to have a look at what the clinic is going to cost you. So remember when we were allocating the amount of time um, in the income estimator of the activities that you're going to, to undertake, this is summarised here in the expenses calculated uh, for you too. So the total suggested nurse time for this particular session is 4.3 hours, so that sort of looks like a a good morning or a good afternoon's amount of work. However, we've made a few changes to the uh, suggested nurse times and um, it's now shown as uh, four, four hours flat for your session. So if that matches what your expectation is, then that's, uh, then that's really terrific. What I would caution you about is if you've got a very large discrepancy between the suggested nurse time and your allocated nurse time, that you might need to just go back to your calculations and just double check that you haven't um, made a a, a, an estimation error in those calculations. So they, they should be reasonably congruent, but they don't need to be, they don't need to be identical. 
So, of course, in terms of the expenditure for your clinic, the largest expense to do with this work will be paid to your GP. In this example here, we are um, putting in the allocation and it is usually based on a percentage um, distribution to GPs that our GP is going to earn 60% of the recurring MBS item um, generated is going to be paid to the GP. And you can change that to whatever is right for your practice. So if you say that needs to be 70%, uh, then you can, you can do that and that will change all of the figures in terms of the expenses and, um, uh, and therefore the, the ongoing viability as well. So if I bring that now back to, to 60%, you can see down the bottom here that has changed the total recurring um, expense per session here. So this is your most important expense to do with this budget planning. There are, of course, other costs associated with uh, with your clinic as well, and the, the key ones there are the admin cost per session as well as your nurse cost per session. So let's have a look at admin cost. You might want to have a think about how much administrative time goes into the creation and the delivery of the session that you have planned. In this example, we have indicated that two hours of administrative time is required to make this session happen. And we've determined that the admin cost per session is $30 per hour. So you'll see here that this is a cost per hour base. Now, um, to some that might look like a, a pretty high amount there, but you need to remember that you've got to include all of your own costs, including superannuation and leave entitlements and any other types of loadings that are applicable to a wage. So it's not a base hourly rate that needs to go in there, but it needs to be marked up to include um, all of the on costs. And that will show then as an expenditure of $60 uh, to do with this nurse clinic. For the nurse cost per session, we've indicated that the allocated nurse time for this session you've determined to be four hours, but we're giving the nurse four and a half hours. There may be a little bit of administrative time to do with that session. Not all of the work is going to be uh, directly including uh, patient, uh, patient attendance or, or client service. So we've just given it an additional um, half an hour of time to be a realistic reflection of, of the time involved for the nurse. And we've marked up the nurse cost per session, again, similarly to what we have done for administrative cost, to a nominal figure of $47 per hour. And that then brings us to $211.50. Furthermore, you can add any other expense that you can think of that's relevant to your practice. There could be some consumables that you need to provide as part of the service that you are running. We've said that's $15 worth. And anything else that you would like to include here, you could put that in as uh, the number of items that you need to be selling and uh, the, the cost per item on that. And it will include it here as an additional expense item as well. Again, I'll just take those away for clarity. Like with the income side, there are also the one-off costs that you might want to consider, especially if you are starting a new clinic. If you're already running your clinics, you might want to leave all of these fields blank. Again, it is entirely up to you how you use that. Nominally here, we've said we need to market our service, our new clinic. We're going to give an allocation of $100 to that. We need to do some staff training um, and have some staff meetings, $400 uh, split over there, and developing some resources, a nominal cost of $50 there. So we've said a one-off cost is going to be $550 to get your clinic up and running. So you say, well, where does that leave us at the end? So then we get to the grand total, which is right up the top of this, um, this budget planner. And you'll see here that if we accept the, uh, the numbers that we've plugged in, in the blue income and the green expenses side, and we run 10 sessions that are modeled along this line, we're going to see a profit of $1,659.80. What you'll see too is if you bring that down to say two um, two sessions to say well what's it going to take to um, uh, to get this 
to get this clinic started. You'll see if you only do two of them, the clinic is going to be running at a loss and that is because of those one-off income and expenditure items that have a bigger impact on a lower number of services than what they have on a higher number. So again, you can play around with these numbers to, um, to make them what you need it to show you to be a, a realistic amount. So again, if you're already running your, your, uh, your, your nurse clinics, then play around with this so that you can see what's actually happening on the ground. The really great thing about this is that it will help to establish that business case for you to either say things are not quite right, we're either not doing enough activities or high enough value activities, or our expenses are too high, um, whereby we offset way too much of that income generated. And from that perspective, um, it will just give you a, a really good feel for whether you're on track or whether you need to tweak any of these items to, um, to make your, your clinic worthwhile. So I'd really encourage you to download that, uh, that budget clinic tool and start playing with it. There is nothing that you can do to it to, um, to break it. So feel free and I would really encourage the nurses and the practice managers to get together and, and work on this together to come up with a really well modelled uh, clinic. So we'll uh, flip across back to, uh, to, to the slides and we're going to have a bit of a look at what a diabetes clinic might look like um, to, uh, to, to give the modelling of that. Would, would Linda? You like, would you like to have a couple of questions? A Sorry, couple of questions sure. sounds Terrific. Excellent. Well, I guess the first question is, are these resources uh, freely available? Yes, they are. You don't need to be an APNA member. So that's um, just on our website and you've got the link to where they are, but we'll send that out to you at the end as well. But there's a couple of questions that are coming up. You talked about the PIPQI. Um, does the diabetes cycle of care and the asthma cycle of care still exist? Uh, they do still exist. So um, I would say hold your horses because mm. we're going to talk a little bit more about these uh, strange item numbers that still appear in the MBS but don't have the value associated with them anymore that, than they did in times gone past. Sure. So I'd say park that one and we will definitely cover this off in the next section. All right. And one other question. It's about that time-based time item numbers. If a nurse is preparing the GPMP or if it's a health assessment, does their time contribute to the time it took to do that um, activity. So the billing. Yes. Uh, yeah. So in terms of the, the, the nurse clinic budgeting tool, the time that you want to indicate in those blue fields is the time that your nurse is going to take. So it's not reflective of the time that a GP may take. And the reason for that is that the GP is usually paid on a percentage of the fee generated rather than on their time. Um, so, yep, only calculate the nurse time in the budget planner. In terms of uh, do does nurse time count, the question is more relevant to health assessments mm, yeah. where, uh, where the nurse time is definitely added to the GP time taken to let you know whether you need to be charging a 701 or a 703 or all the way up to a 707. So that's the only area in uh, the, the MBS where, um, where the nurse's time can be legitimately added on to the GP time. If you're thinking about um, consultation item numbers, if any of that takes place as part of this, you cannot add the nurse's time on. It's not permitted. Medicare absolutely would frown upon it. Mm -hmm. uh, don't do it. Okay. So there is a caveat too on the, the budget planner to say make sure that you understand the compliance requirements around Medicare before you start using any of these items. So the budget planner doesn't delve into the, that compliance to any great degree, but it is absolutely incumbent on everybody to ensure that they really understand the item numbers and what Medicare expects from you mm -hmm. before you claim any of them. So just, yep. just to be really clear about that. All right. Thanks, Rivka. I think that's, that'll cover the questions for now. Fine. Keep going. Let's, uh, yep. let's keep going with a very colourful mind map that you can see up on your screen here. And uh, this is uh, what, what we're going to work through is uh, really a, a step through of the sorts of questions and ideas that you will want to be thinking about if you want to get established with a diabetes clinic. And a diabetes clinic is probably one of the, the more common types of nurse clinics that practices are running with these days. So let's, uh, let's step through this. 
First of all, you will want to, in the pink section there, have a think about the, the kinds of services that might be applicable to this, um, this, uh, this diabetes uh, clinic that you're going to run. So it could include GP management plans, your item 721. It could include team care arrangements, your item 723. It could be a review of either of those. So you'll see too there the annual, uh, diabetes annual cycle of care is listed there. Um, um, in terms of the level B, C and D services. And again, you can see there's a little bit of a green arrow there to say just pay attention to this because this is important. The changes to the, the service incentive program and the practice incentives program means that these item numbers are still available, but you really only want to use them if you are completing a diabetes annual cycle of care in association with also completing a GP management plan or a team care arrangement. And the reason for that is that uh, you are unable to claim any attendance item in association with a GP management plan or a team care arrangement. However, you can claim an, a diabetes annual cycle of care. There are quite a number of compliance requirements to completing the annual cycle of care. And interestingly now, the Medicare rebate um, for the equivalent level B, C and D is actually a little bit lower than what it is for the commensurate attendance items. So your items 23, 36s and, uh, and 44s. So that's the caveat here and, and I'll run through that again in, um, in a moment as well. So if you are doing a GP management plan and team care arrangement and you have completed an annual cycle of care for a patient, you can charge those item numbers and I would encourage you to do it. I'd encourage you to do it mostly because the annual cycle of care is just such a fabulous best practice activity for the management of diabetes. So you do it because it's really terrific for your patients and you will get a little bit of, uh, a, little bit of a Medicare rebate, not as nice as what it was uh, before November last year, uh, 2019, but it is still there. So that's the reason why you can still charge these item numbers. If you're completing a diabetes annual cycle of care and you are not also undertaking these care planning activities, I would recommend that you don't charge these item numbers, but you stick to your normal level B, C or D attendance items instead. So uh, determining the services to be provided, you might also be thinking about other items that, uh, that you want to run through, whether it's health assessments, a, a domiciliary med medication management review, case conferencing, group services, mental health care plans. So we certainly don't have time to run through each of those and how they may, uh, may interact in that space, but just think about what all of those, uh, those opportunities are. Once you've got a clear idea of what you want to provide, you then need to determine the service um, order and priority. So obviously, if uh, there is time to complete all of the activities in the session that you've got available, you would go, you would go for it, of course, complete them all. If not, you then need to prioritise and determine which are the most important ones to, uh, to do first of. In terms of item exclusions, and um, I, I alluded to this just, uh, just previously, so Medicare restricts the co-claiming of attendance items, so that the, the big block of item numbers that you see on the left of the box there, they are all item numbers uh, that, that are relating to patient attendances. You are unable to charge them with chronic disease management items, specifically GP management plans, your item 721, team care arrangements, item 723, and um, item 732, which is the review of a GP management plan or TCA. The other items that you see uh, listed there are for non-vocationally registered GPs there. So all those attendance items cannot be charged at the same time as the chronic disease um, items, the care planning. Um, I'd also refer you just to, to the URL that's uh, listed in orange there, which gives you a whole lot more information um, about uh, chronic disease management, GP management plans and team care arrangements and what Medicare's expectations are around that. 
So, of course, before you go much further, you want to be establishing the eligibility for a care plan. Um, certainly, well, PRO does not use quite so often anymore. It's, it's mostly uh, through HPOS, but you can certainly also call Medicare and uh, check that the patient is clinically um, and service-wise eligible to receive that service. They need to obviously have a chronic condition that has been or will be present for six months or more, and then you can go ahead and, uh, and run your service services. So it might be tricky to see all of the detail on here, but basically we've decided that we're going to go ahead and create a GP management plan. The key steps involved there are firstly obtaining consent, then running a number of those clinical activities um, as listed there. And um, I, again, I won't go through, uh, through all of them in, in too much detail. We are then uh, wanting to finalise that plan, get the GP approval, make sure that we give the documents to the patients, remember your reminders and recalls and of course remember billing too because if you don't do that then your whole budget planning is just going to fall to pieces so, um, so, so that's, not, uh, that's not so good. Um, we've then decided that there might be a team care arrangement that comes out of that as well and um, uh, again there's, there's a number of activities to, to go along with that. So in terms of your GP management plan, in terms of the nurse activity associated with that, just want to slightly focus on um, ensuring that what you do is focus on the patient agreed goals and you'll see that in, in big writing because that is just so important. We still see quite a lot of uh, GP management plans that are quite sort of generic in nature. They are sort of template documents that don't have a lot of customization and certainly patient agreed goals are still frequently not quite there yet. So think about what's actually important to the patient um, and they may not be clinical indicators uh, at all. Use that coaching approach to support your patients and uh, determine whether your patient is actually ready to make some changes and have that buy-in to, to the process that you're undertaking here. So look at supporting, engaging and guiding your patients. Certainly don't, uh, don't lecture. So that's a, a little, little side recommendation there. Now, um, remember with the budget planner, we sort of spoke about the admin time to do with your nurse clinic. So here we've actually identified some of the activities that your admin team might be involved in, in actually running your clinic. Obviously, you want to make the best use of your nursing time and, and um, get, get the best outcomes. So admin should be doing administrative tasks and nurses should be doing the nursing tasks. So here are some examples. Admin staff may be in involved in um, the, the plan referral and feedback documents to be provided to your allied health. And there may be several ways that you actually achieve that. So again, the mind mapping is just giving you that thought uh, process to help you determine how you actually achieve all of this. Your admin staff might also be collecting feedback um, on uh, documents in terms of your team care arrangements specifically. So um, you might be thinking of using a spreadsheet to just keep on task to make sure that you meet all of those Medicare requirements regarding uh, feedback on team care arrangements, contacting your providers and documenting that information in the patient file. Admin staff can also uh, be involved in just confirming that recall dates have been entered into the system and that they are all correct and your administrative staff can also be involved in completing the, uh, the billing for the team care arrangements. And then when uh, time goes past and the patient is due for a recall again, that they actually process those recalls and remind us to get the patients back in to complete those activities. Now, just another quick, uh, quick flip through the diabetes annual cycle of care. There are a number of activities that are mandated if you're going to use those item numbers as we discussed before. There are a number of one-off items uh, that you need to ensure you've covered off. Uh, there are some activities that need to be done every six months, for example, um, height, uh, weight, blood pressure, feet examination, etc. 
Every 12 months there are a number of activities to be undertaken as well to do with some uh, pathology testing, haemoglobin A1Cs need to be done on an annual basis, lipids, uh, GFRs and um, ACRs also need to be done on an annual basis. You must provide self-care education to your, your patients as well and uh, think about the, uh, the GP review, also think about the, the, the SNAP guidelines in, in terms of your uh, patient self-care education as well. The GP is going to review all of this as well in terms of medication, the approval for a completion of a diabetes cycle of care, billing it on the completion of the item and setting the reminder and every two years uh, the patient needs to have a comprehensive eye exam as well and just another reminder to just use these diabetes annual cycle of care item numbers if you're completing it at the same time as completing a care plan um, and again it's really to do with the, with the lower rebates for the annual cycle of care compared to attendance items. Can I ask a question Rivka? via the, our audience. So can you bill a, a diabetes cycle of care and a GPMP on the same day? Can the GP do that? Um, look, you, you could, but it really depends on whether all of the activities to mm. do with the team care arrangement have been completed at that yep. time of service yep. provision. Yep. Realistically speaking, that's actually quite hard to do because the feedback that's required is not just an agreement to participate mm -hmm. in a care plan. Yep. What Medicare is asking for, and they are really quite strict regulations and requirements, is that there is collaboration about the team care arrangement. Yeah. So the allied health provider or um, whoever is involved in, in being the, uh, the, the team carer needs to have the opportunity to have a collaborative discussion about what's in that care plan. Whether that happens or not is, uh, is kind of another question, mm. but that meaningful engagement about what you're going to be delivering to the patient is a Medicare expectation. Sure. So that's why... Um, if you're going to follow the letter of the law of Medicare, it's quite difficult to bill it at the same time. Mm. However, if there is some time delay between getting that information back from the allied health providers um, and the date that the service was provided, mm. the team care arrangement can be backdated to the date that the team care arrangement was actually created but it can be billed at a later date. And the good thing about that is it keeps the dates congruent as yep. you're going forward so that you don't end up with split dates for a GP management plan and a team care arrangement, but you are co covering off all of those compliance requirements yeah. as well. Good, and I think, again, I think Rivka directed the audience earlier, but make sure you're checking your these facts on the MBS on, online as well. It's really important that you're aware of all the, rec all the regulations. Yep. Definitely, exactly. Okay, um, so, sorry, were there any other questions? Oh, there's quite a few, but you keep going. And oh, remote. we're nearly yeah, through the yeah, slides, yeah. so let's yeah. just work through the last bit here and, and we'll cover off um, a few more questions. Yeah. So don't forget your 10997 item numbers as well. Remember that uh, your patients who are on a GP management plan and, or, or team care arrangement can have up to five visits per year. You'll need to document those to keep track. And you want to use them to keep track of progress. So the services need to be related to the patient's chronic condition. And there are a number of uh, suggestions of the types of activities that you could undertake and charge that as a 10997. Um, and obviously that would be done at a, at a time that is outside of preparing a care plan. And the 10997 is good because in itself, it doesn't require a doctor's attendance. So that could be an independent nurse attendance. Um, it would still be billed under the, the GP's provider number, but yep. it doesn't require a, um, a GP attendance. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's basically the mind map of what a diabetes nurse clinic might look like. Do want to encourage you to just think a little bit more broadly as well, and especially for the practices who are already uh, a little bit more experienced with running nurse clinics, there are lots of other uh, clinic type scenarios that you might want to contemplate. So whether it's an asthma clinic, a COPD or a cardiovascular disease clinic, cervical screening, 
men's clinics, women's clinics, youth or teen clinics. There are just so many um, novel options that you can be running. So think about what your patient demographics is telling you, where are the needs within your patient population and focus your services in that space. And that's it for me. So well, hit me with your questions. Well done, Rivka. There's so much information in this, isn't there? I hope I haven't been talking too fast. No, no, no. It's fantastic. So look... Uh, how do nurse practitioners fit into the, these models of nurse clinics? Yeah, uh, nurse practitioners are, are interesting. Um, they, they, of course, have access to their own item numbers, which haven't been modelled in the nurse clinic budgeting tool, but you could certainly introduce them in the practice own item so they can be, they can be added in. Yeah. Um, what I would say is uh, that, you know, my experience is, is that nurse practitioners, the, the business modelling for them is really very tough. They can certainly work as uh, very independent pr uh, providers, which is really terrific. But unfortunately, the Medicare rebates associated with those item numbers is really very poor. Mm. And in most, uh, most entities, most organisations where nurse practitioners are engaged, other sources of, of funding are required in order to support the, the wages for a nurse practitioner. Yep. So uh, they, are difficult, uh, th they are difficult to run. So if there is nothing other than the nurse practitioner income coming through, it's, uh, it's, it's a very tricky, tricky mechanism to, to keep that viable. Uh, I would certainly be hounding your PHNs and, and seeking other, um, other funding sources to ensure that you can run this. I believe that, um, that the nurses are becoming far more vocal in, in advocating for nurse practitioners and, and hopefully the Medicare rebates will start reflecting that in time as well. But it's, I don't have any simple answers for that. No, thank you. That's um, a good answer. Um, so a question about cervical screening. Um, how do nurses do cervical screening without GP involvement? I thought it was a Medicare requirement to have a GP. Uh, yes, that's a really terrific question as well. So there isn't, uh, there isn't a Medicare item number specifically for cervical screening. However, I certainly know of practices where uh, credentialed uh, cervical uh, screening nurses have been able to run services and charge for that independently. So it's a private, gap mm. fee and out-of-pocket cost for patients. And uh, the way that these are most often run is actually as a well women's clinic rather mm. than just a cervical screening mm. clinic. What tends to happen is that the services that are provided is far broader than just a, uh, a, cervical, yep. a cervical screening test. Yep. And it actually becomes a far more inclusive women's service. And my experience is that the nurses who are, are really well skilled at this Patients will be lining up to access those services and they're very happy to pay for them. That's been my experience. Yep. And in those situations, you actually don't need to involve a GP at all. You certainly would want to have a GP there in case there are um, any complications that, that require mm -hmm. a GP input. But under that type of model, it can run really quite successfully as a, a wholly independent service. If that's not an option, then you need to look at your workflows of introducing a GP somewhere along that visit to ensure that there is at least a, um, an attendance item to come along with it. I would say be careful because if you start looking at the figures and putting it into your nurse clinic budgeting model, you'll see that uh, that becomes quite marginal when you consider the, uh, the expenditure for the GP yep, yep. as well as the time taken for the nurse. So this is why the budgeting is really important that you, you uh, roll out realistic services that can stand on their own two feet. Yep, and certainly the budget tool allows you to play around with the different concepts. Absolutely, yep. it is entirely flexible, so yep. make it work. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so there's a, a, a specific question about the tool itself. Um, with the planned number of sessions, over what time frame is this for? Weekly, monthly, how long is one session? Well, again, Rivka. It is completely flexible. So yep. you could plan it out for a day, a week, a month, yep. a year, a decade, if that's what you wanted to do. So, it, again, what you're wanting to, to do is to ask... Um, what, what is the question that you want to answer with the budget modelling? Do you want to see if over a six-month period or over a 12-month period whether the services that you are running are actually viable? And this is why I also recommend it for practices who are already running nurse clinics 
when they frequently have difficulty putting their finger on whether it's actually remunerating them at an okay level or not, that you can use the budgeting tool to actually pull out the activities that are, are being undertaken to tell you whether it is or whether it isn't. Um, so, yeah, again, it, it's entirely flexible as to um, how long you want to use that modelling for. Remember, too, of course, that over time the Medicare benefit schedule changes as well. Mm. So that's yep. where you will get some variation with uh, with the figures as well. Yep. So I probably wouldn't run it for any more than, you know, certainly 12 months would yep. be absolute max. Yep. But more realistic is, is maybe six months or even three months to mm. just give you a really good idea. And remember, too, that, that the numbers out of the... The budgeting tool, they're not going to be 100% accurate. This is giving you ballpark figures. It is not going to tell you down to the last cent yep. what it's going to look like in reality, but it will give you good confidence of whether you're on the right track yeah, or not. Yeah, and I think in our experience with the nurse clinic projects, if you can go to your manager with that um, a basic, more than a basic understanding of the budget, of, of the financial viability of your concept, then it's more likely that they're going to support you. That's moving exactly forward. right. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's a lot of questions around the intricacies of, of billing the GPMP and the TCA and, and when can you... Um, I, well, there's basically there's a lot of questions around that. I think it probably would be best because we can't tease them all, all of those issues out. We can't tease them out. But I would go to MBS online and just really you need to look at the... At the, at the fine print. Absolutely. Yeah. There is a lot of detail in there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this, it is a really complex space. Yeah. So, um, and at PHN. the outset, yes, yeah. PHN, absolutely. You, you really need to do your homework about yeah. these items. So just remember that Medicare does audit yeah. these activities. It is really important that you, uh, you stick to the rule of law as far as uh, claiming your item numbers is, is concerned. So do that together with your practice manager. Um, I would really encourage nurses to look more closely at the MBS as well because it not only will give you a better sense of that compliance that sits around it, but it will also open up your eyes to mm. what the opportunities are as well. So further training in that is, is, is definitely recommended. Yeah, definitely. And the PHN is a great resource for getting that support. Um, probably one of our last questions, it's about the heart health check. Can it be billed with anything else? Um, a heart health check is billed in exactly the same way that uh, a health assessment is. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. can't bill them together with a health assessment, mm -hmm. but you could you could certainly bill a heart health assessment in association with a GP management plan. Mm -hmm. But I would um, also caution that if a patient already has established heart disease, you can't charge a heart health check. So this is only for patients without yes, established exactly right. um, cardiovascular yes. disease. Good point. So just, again, look very carefully at the, the compliance around that. But it could be done at the same time if all of the item criteria have been met. Absolutely. Now, there's one, probably one last question about the spreadsheet. It's where do you put the costs around rent and electricity? And I think you did actually cover that, but if you yeah, maybe... Yeah, so, so that would be in, um, in the other areas. If we just um, flip back to, uh, to the spreadsheet. Beautiful. Let me just navigate around there. So that would be in... Um, in your other costs here. So in this session here, um, or in, in these boxes here, uh, this uh, box here is for the number that you want to apply and then the fee that you want to apply. So if you want to say, uh, well, for this, uh, for this session, we want to include a, a rental cost of um, $100 for that, this is how you would do it. And uh, you'll see that it, it adds $100 uh, in there. So again, think about, um, you know, what does your, your session actually constitute? So perhaps $100 for, for rental might be a little bit high for a half-day session. But again, you, you can make that w whatever you deem it to be. And you'll, you'll see the outcome of that in, um, in that overall profitability um, and loss there as well. If you earn income out of running some of those services, you, um, you might want to add that into um, either the nurse-only item numbers or, um, you know, or into 
uh, into other allocations uh, there as well. So whether it is as part of uh, grant funding or one of the other areas, if you want to add it in as a practice own item, you can certainly do that here. Probably um, the nurse only item, this line here would be the, the right one um, to, to add in um, rental income if that is something sure. that you earn as well. So again, it can be whatever it is. So yep. there is a spot for anything that you can think of in terms of income as well as expenditure. Well, Rivka, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate your input today. Thank you for having me. Um, so if anybody wants more information, we'll put the link up to, well, the webinar will come into your email following this session, but we'll also put a link on our website under the tools, um, Nurse Clinic Tools and Resources page. We've, we also have other resources there around different nurse clinic models because there's some questions here that we, we haven't got to, like if you want to run a clinic and it doesn't, you don't have, you can't claim the chronic disease management numbers. So we do have some models there that you might want to look at as well. Um, lastly, please complete the survey, uh, the evaluation survey. It's really important to get your feedback. And once again, we thank you for attending today's session. Hope, hope, we hope you found it interesting. Thank you.